One recurring issue or difficulty that you find from time to time in the course of pastoral practice is this question of what do I do when I'm faced with a problem which is difficult, painful, certainly not of my own choosing, which doesn't have an immediate solution, if you will. Is it simply a matter of waiting for God to speak to me by way of, you know, the voice in the clouds or the burning bush? Or perhaps is there another way of looking at this particular issue? Perhaps I suggest that one way to kind of frame this particular issue in a constructive sort of way is to look at it through the lens of Matthew chapter 13, particularly through the lens of three parables. The parable of the weeds and the wheat, the parable of the mustard seed, and the parable of the leavened bread. So with regards to the parable of the weeds and the wheat, obviously the wheat represents good things in the world, whereas the weeds represent evil things in the world. And as the story goes, basically there's these workers in the field and they go to bed and the next morning they realize that weeds have emerged in the midst of the wheat in this field. And their natural inclination, of course, is to worry, to panic, as a result of which they go to the owner, the owner of the field, and they say to him, look, if you want, master, we will go to the field and we'll uproot the weeds from the midst of the wheat. But then, of course, the master says no, right? He says, don't uproot the weeds prematurely, lest you damage the weeds. Wait until the harvest time, and at that point, the weeds can be separated from the wheat. Now, obviously, it's kind of a simple enough story, but it kind of begs the obvious question, what's the takeaway message? Well, basically, the takeaway message is essentially twofold. And so, first of all, the story makes it pretty clear that throughout the course of this pilgrim journey here on this earth, there will always be the weeds amongst the wheat. And so therefore, there will always be pain, suffering, difficulty, problems of every kind. As the Holy Spirit is struggling to emerge victorious in terms of bringing about the salvation of the world, and as we ourselves struggle to become the persons that God has called us to be. And so therefore, the invitation is to not be surprised or scandalized when we find, again, the weeds amongst the wheat. But secondly, and kind of more to the point, the Lord invites us to recognize that if He permits the weeds to coexist with the wheat, it's to bring about a greater good. And so if you read between the lines of the regards to this particular story, first of all, obviously there's this kind of concern that if you try to uproot evil prematurely, you will damage the good things that God's trying to do in the context of the world. But secondly, there's this idea that we can't really tell. A lot of times we can't really tell the difference between the things which are good for us and the things which simply are not. And this comes through in this really interesting but often overlooked detail when it comes to the parable of the weeds and the wheat, whereby basically if you look at the weeds, apparently they can look like wheat in the early stages, which again reinforces this point that sometimes we can't tell a difference. And so when we try to uproot evil prematurely, we might be damaging the good things that God is trying to bring about through the complexities of this world. But that brings us, of course, to the second parable, the parable of the mustard seed which can be summarized in a relatively short line, right? And so basically the Lord talks about this seed, this really small mustard seed, which is so small that it's almost imperceptible when you hold it in your palm, which has the capacity to grow into this enormous shrub, a shrub which can apparently grow upwards to 9 or 12 feet. And so the takeaway message is that when it comes to God's grace, when it comes to God kind of working out the salvation of the world in concrete circumstances, typically His grace begins in small things, hidden things, Things which seem so hidden that they seem to be almost non-existent, but which in time end up bearing tremendous fruit. And so the whole idea is kind of twofold. To first of all, not get overly caught up in that which the world finds to be important and valuable, but also not to dismiss things in the world just because they seem kind of small, hidden, and therefore seemingly unimportant. And so therefore, the invitation in a certain sense is to focus on doing the few things the Lord wants you to do carefully and well over a long period of time as opposed to looking for the knockout punch, if you will, to try to bring about immediate results right away. Okay, but that brings us to the final parable I want to talk about, which again is the parable of the leavened bread. And so the story here is relatively straightforward and simple, right? And so basically here's this woman who kneads into this certain amount of flour, the yeast, and the resulting amount of bread can feed up to roughly 100 people, so a ton of bread. Now, as you probably know, the fathers of the church, they're really big when it comes to allegory, right? So looking at the gospel, looking at the parables, saying that like this represents that, right? And so in this case, that's really helpful. And so what they say kind of collectively is that the woman represents the church, the flower represents us, and the leaven represents Jesus Christ, who himself alone is the principle of growth when it comes to our lives and when it comes to the world. But, you know, for my money, the key to really interpreting this particular parable, again, the parable of the leavened bread, is to focus on exactly how the woman adds the yeast to the flour. And so if you look carefully at the wording of the story, the woman doesn't simply put the leaven into the flour. No, instead she hides the leaven deep within the flour. 
And again, if you remember that 11 essentially represents Christ himself, who again alone is the principle of growth in our lives, the invitation is to hide Jesus Christ deep within our hearts, deep within our souls, to invite him to touch the innermost recesses of our hopes and dreams and our aspirations and our deep desires. Okay, now obviously there's kind of a lot going on here, but it kind of begs the question, like what does this mean for us kind of practically speaking? Well, perhaps I might kind of put all these different parables together by framing it like this. So imagine you're facing a particular problem which doesn't have an immediate solution. Whether we're talking about something out there or something within yourself or perhaps more likely some combination thereof, right? And so the question is, what do you do? First of all, to not be surprised, right? To not be surprised, to not be scandalized that you're facing yet another problem, right? Because such is our lot when it comes to the pilgrim journey. But more to the point, it's important not to give into lies with regards to your particular situation as it pertains to your identity, your self-worth, and your relationship with God. And so, for example, you don't want to say to yourself, well, because I'm in a situation of difficulty, especially when it doesn't have an immediate solution, therefore God doesn't love me or God has somehow abandoned me. You need to remember the parable of the weeds and the wheat. If the Lord permits the weeds to coexist with the wheat as he does, then obviously it's to permit a greater good. Some good in the world, but also in the context of your particular life. So don't be surprised, don't be panicked, and again, don't give into lies with regards to yourself or your relationship with God. But instead, perhaps renew this sense in your heart that you're called to focus on the big picture in a long game. To not allow yourself to be overly frustrated with the process, but instead to have the patience and the wherewithal to simply let things play out. Again, with this underlying spirit of humility and trust. But on top of that, perhaps the second thing you might do is to remember again the parable of the mustard seed. And specifically to ask yourself, what is some obvious thing that I should be doing that perhaps I'm not doing? Am I going to Mass? Am I going to confession? Do I have this regular habit of prayer? And on top of that, what are some sensible things that I can do right now to kind of move the situation along? Again, perhaps not something really flashy and dramatic, which points more to my impatience and my desire to kind of resolve the issue fruitfully, but instead something which is sensible, something which is simple, something which is small, which is meant to bear fruit over a long period of time, slowly moving the particular issue to a final resolution. In any case, the third and final thing you might do with regards to the situation which has no kind of immediate solution is to ask yourself, is there some aspect of the situation, or my own heart for that matter, that I'm not bringing to the Lord, right? And so certainly we're called to bring the situation or the problem to the Lord, to surrender to Him, obviously, that goes without saying. But secondly, to again, kind of bring different aspects of our hearts to the Lord as they're being exposed through the situation at hand. And this is a really common thing, right? You're working through a particular issue and all of a sudden you realize in retrospect, gosh, I have all these insecurities and fears and apprehensions and, and woundedness and sin. And again, the invitation is to bring all these things to the Lord recurringly over and over again as they're being brought to the service and as they're being exposed, doing all these things in the very spirit of the parable of the unleavened bread. Now, obviously, there's kind of a lot of moving parts here, but hopefully you can see that the common denominator with regards to all these different things you might do with regards to the situation, which again is painful and ongoing and which has no immediate solution, is that you're meant to focus on the journey as opposed to the destination. In particular, to realize that in the midst of all this, Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God who is with you, God who is with us, right? And so therefore, practically speaking, there's nothing to be deferred, right? And so you don't need to hold your breath until the Lord speaks to you by way of, again, the voice in the clouds or the voice in the burning bush, but realize that in ways which are imperceptible to you, perhaps for the most part, God is already working out your salvation and the salvation of the world in a way which is amazing and incredible and which will exceed your wildest expectations. And may God bless you all.